Welcome around the table yarn sock club, uh, April 3rd, and it's not an April Fool's. We've got Kate Atherley with us, and she's going to talk about her socks, the fast forward toe up DK. Am I getting that all? Yeah. Socks. That's and it. We're, we're delighted to have you with us. I'm going to make you host. Thank or I'm going to at least make you able to share your screen. Yeah, that would be super. Thank you. Because I've got my camera here and then I can show you some things. Needless to say, I've got some socks. Yes. Perfect. To talk about. All right. So you, uh, I believe anybody can share, but please let's just let Kate do it. <laughs> All right. Are we good to go or are we waiting for a few more? Um, we're recording, so it's okay if we're, if people are joining us in progress, although is it just now? It's just now six. Um, maybe before we, we go, 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 I just, do you want to talk about my dog is going to do the laundry behind me. <laughs> it's okay. That is hysterical. Tebow, sweetie, honey, James, James. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah. Welcome. Whereas to uh, my dog's probably doing something similar, but in the next room. So it's fine. It's and off, off camera. Yes. Yeah, more, most importantly, yes. Uh, well, um, welcome, everybody. If it's okay, Keep yourselves on mute. I'll try not to, to talk all the time. Um, if you have a question, you're more than welcome. And I will try and keep um, an eye on the chat so that I can see it and, and ask Kate as we're going. Um, and do you, before you start, start, do you want to talk a little bit about your inspiration for the fast forward socks or why you like knitting socks or a little, little sock tidbit for us? I can talk about socks from sun up to sundown. So um, I'm an indiscriminate sock knitter. Would that be a good word for it? I just like knitting socks. I will knit them toe up. I will knit them top down. I will knit them with any yarn that's going. I just love knitting socks. I mean, I've got two sock projects on my desk here right now. They're just comfort knitting for me. And um, I think one of the things I like about sock knitting is they can be as challenging or as comforting as you want them to be so you can have a very plain sock in terms of plain knitting which is great if you're watching something really good on tv or if you're having a conversation or you're tired or you can have a challenging you know an interesting and engaging sock where there's lots of pattern stitches and lots of interesting fun stuff to learn maybe a new technique like working from the toe up i also I love wild sock yarns as well. I like sock yarns that are bright colors and that are variegated. I mean, I've got some, let's see, I've got uh, these, let's see, and I've got these, and I've got lots of um, leaning towards the citrusy colors at the moment, but I like a variegated, you know, I just, whatever. I, I just feel like there's something for every mood from a knitting perspective, and there's something from every move, mood from a style perspective as well, in terms of what I feel like I want to wear. In the depths of the winter, I love wearing wild colored socks. You know, you don't see the sun for a little while. We had a very, very gloomy winter, and I like my socks to be bright. Careful. Um, but what I also love about sock knitting is that it's portable. So it really just is a small bag that fits in the corner of your, you know, if you're commuting to work or in the corner of your purse or, and you, you can just, they're just there for you, and, you know, and, and then all of those things, the joy of the crafting. But I think it's really wonderful to be able to make something so practical that we wear all the time. And I think there's a there's a fun kind of dichotomy in that and that we're investing all this love into something that we wear all the time and we maybe take for granted. But I like that we're, we have the power to do that, that we, we have the power to make something that's so fundamental to keeping ourselves warm and comfortable in the winter. Yeah, absolutely. Never, never not love sock knitting. I um, knitted my first sock shortly after I finished university. Uh, and I'd moved to a new town and I was living around the corner uh, from a really, really good yarn store. And I knitted all along. I'd sort of dabbled in it. And I knew that my grandmother had been uh, a, a sort of a legendary sock knitter. So I wandered into this yarn store confronted with a wall of brightly colored sock yarn. And I said, oh, I should try it. If granny could do it, I can do it too. And then that was 
1996 and I have knitted I've counted quite literally hundreds and hundreds of pairs of socks since then and there's just there's always socks on the go in my life and it's nice that's nice yeah so yeah I wanted to you know try toe up uh I learned to knit top down first because I think that was the more I'm not saying I think here that was the more traditional direction to knit socks mm -hmm. but um I first tried knitting toe up socks for the pure curiosity of it but then toe up socks have some advantages particularly when you're using a non-standard yarn because the the concern is always running out of yarn mm -hmm. Now, I have pretty small feet. I wear about a size six shoe. So with a typical 100 gram skein of sock yarn, I'm sure. never really worried uh, about running out. But what, as soon as you change to a more, uh, you know, a different yarn that doesn't have the same amount of yardage, then we have to think about making sure that we don't run out, especially if it's a one off you know, one of those one of a kind hand dyed yarn ske skeins. And so working toe up is brilliant for that because you just you divide the ball into two equally, you know, split them equally, and then you just knit the leg till you're done, which is great. So a definite advantage. I also, between you and me, I think there's a personality thing going on with toe up versus top down. I feel like, you know, if you're the sort of person that got your homework done the night it was assigned, <laughs> you might be a toe up sock knitter because with toe up sock knitting, you get the crunchy stuff done first, right? Because the toe, we have to pay attention to the toe, regardless of which, which direction we're going. And so you get the, the toe and that's done and dusted. And then you've got some plain knitting for a while and then you've got the heel. Uh, but then it's really plain sailing from there once you've turned the heel and it really is autopilot knitting. Whereas if perhaps you were the sort of person who maybe postponed the tricky stuff, uh, just a theory just a theory <laughs> i don't know but i honestly i go both ways i will knit whichever socks in whichever direction and i'll i'll usually have one of each on the go mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it's a case of just lining up a pattern stitch sometimes it's a case of managing yardage sometimes it's a case of just i want to do them the other way around for fun so yeah so um and i saw double pointed needles yes do you like other methods or is that your favorite? Um, I, I'm pretty sort of casual about this too. Um, when I'm at home, I typically go back to double pointed needles because they are for me, they're the, the way I learned and they are the fastest okay. for me, for the way that I knit. Um, if I'm, taking my socks on the road uh, if I know that I'm going to be out of the house or somewhere where dropping a needle will be a disaster uh, I once on a very long flight on an eight-hour flight I lost one of my double pointed needles about 15 minutes into the flight and I was not no. a happy camper <laughs> I'm more dangerous on a plane if I don't have my knitting than if I do um, so if I'm traveling I will typically change off to magic loop okay uh, because then and you can also just, you know, put it down when you need to if you're it's your train station is coming up or they bring you a cup of coffee, whatever it is, you can just put it down. But because of the way I knit, I'm going to express an opinion here, um, magic loops a little slower for me. Okay, I find the step to reposition the stitches just drags a bit. I don't know. But yeah, honestly. From my perspective, it's all valid. And that's why I write the patterns the way I do. If you're working from the pattern, you'll see this in the instructions. Some patterns will say, put 15 stitches on one needle and 15 stitches on another, but that's making unfair assumptions mm -hmm. because I don't know if what kind of needles you're using. And it's all the same working on double points or working on magic loop or working on two circulars or working on these tiny sock length circulars. They all make a sock. Um, and so I really, it doesn't matter. You should use the method that works best for you. And sometimes what works best is the one that you know. Sometimes it's which needles are available. And as I say, for me, it's situational depending on where I'm going to be. And so, yeah, that's how I write my instructions too. So, 
That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Well, would you like to? I can do some dive right in. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen here and let's quickly just check. So I have you spotlighted. Oh, good. Excellent. So are you seeing my screen? Yes. Good. Okay. So sorry, inelegant heap of socks there. Let me show you some of my samples that I've been waving around. So although I did say that I will knit socks in any direction, uh, there is one circumstance in which I will only ever go toe up, and that's when I knit knee socks. Oh, I don't okay. knit knee socks very often. They are marvelous. But at that point, you're into, it's a big commitment. I may as well knit a sweater, mm -hmm. I think. They are lovely, though, in February. Knee socks are great. When I knit knee socks, I always work them from the toe up just because you can try them on as you go. Uh, when I'm talking about trying them on, I'm not really talking about the foot. I'm talking about the leg length. Mm -hmm. um so yeah so toe up socks so these are all use the same structure and i've got some samples using different yarns here all using my same pattern i don't i no longer have this the pink samples that we took the photos of mm -hmm. the problem with being a knitwear designer is my samples get, get get taken away for photography or for use in um uh use in demos and things but yeah so this is a, this is using a thicker yarn a dk weight yarn this is using a, a fingering weight yarn a sort more of a sock yarn and so these all use the same recipe and they start at the tip of the tip of the toe here and I'm going to demonstrate the cast on. So I use Judy's magic cast on for the tip of the toe. And you increase till you hit the, the full stitch count and it's plain sailing for a little while. And then I'm relaxed about, <laughs> fluff. I'm relaxed about a lot of things to do with sock knitting, what needles you use, what yarn you use, which direction you go. But one thing I'm, I'm less kind of cavalier about is fit. Sock fits really important to me because I've got, I mentioned a size six foot, I've got smaller feet than average. And when I first learned to knit socks, oh, I knocked my camera there, sorry, you don't need it for just a moment. Anyway, when I first learned to knit socks, I was learning from a pattern that came in a single size, which at the time, it didn't occur to me that that wasn't go wasn't going to be helpful because when we buy socks in the store, you just buy, this is the sock, here you go, what color do you want? Um, but when we're making them for ourselves, the size is more important because socks feel better when they fit right. And more practically speaking, they last longer when they fit right. And I, this is one of these things that I hesitate to say to, uh, uh, um, you know, somebody who's not knit a sock before in at all, but it's an investment of time, right? It is. There are quicker things to knit. Mm -hmm. You can make a fingerless mitten in less time than you can make a sock. So if we're going to knit socks, if we're going to invest the time and we're going to invest the love and we're going to invest the price of the sock yarn as well, let's be honest, you know, because I'm sure you, all sock knitters, it feels like I've had this experience on when somebody comes up to you, you know, you're knitting in public, you're at the mall or you're at the airport or you're on a, on a bus or something and somebody comes up to you and says, what are you knitting? And you say a sock and they say, helpfully, <laughs> you know, you can buy those in the store, right? Yeah, it's funny the first 700 times they say it, maybe not, but you can buy them in the store and they are less expensive, but I want them to last a good long time. And so making the socks the right size is a really important piece of this. So you, my sock patterns never come in one size because we all have different size feet. And it's the sock size where it comes into play is it comes into play at different stitch counts. So that is addressing the circumference of your foot and your leg, but also different foot lengths too, because we have radically different foot lengths. So one of the aspects of my structure here, so let me go back to my camera. I'm going to cooperate, dear camera, on you. There we go. Is the way my instructions are written is that we cast on for the toe, you increase to the stitch count you need, and then you work in the round. And the pattern will say something like work in the round until it's 
so many inches short of the finish length that you want. Because I can't tell you how long this should be. You're going to need to measure your feet. And so it'll be working the round till it's usually on the round, maybe about four inches short of what you need it to be, three to four inches short of what you need it to be. And then you start your increases and we increase for the gusset. And so this is the other aspect of sock fit is that most of us have feet that are symmetrical in one way, but not in another. For most adults, the circumference of our ankle around just the narrowest part of our ankle, usually just kind of above or below the ankle bone. The circumference of your ankle and the circumference of the ball of your foot are usually pretty darn close. They're usually pretty much the same, which if you've knitted socks before, you may actually have sort of know that without realizing that you know that because when you knit a sock, think about how many stitches are on the leg and think about how many stitches are on this part of the foot. It's usually the same number. And it's got nothing to do with I thought for years it was because of how the heel worked. Well, it's got nothing to do with that. And it's got everything to do with that our feet generally are the same here and here, which by the way, points to an instant customization. So with these socks, as you're coming around the, and doing the last step of the heel, you'll be doing decreases. If you need to decrease more or less, like if you need to have more stitches on the leg than you do on the foot, just don't decrease as much. So if you've got wider ankles, for example, if you need fewer stitches on the ankle, I've got a brother who used to be a runner. He has feet like snowshoes and toothpick ankles. So for him, I decrease more as I'm coming up here because this is a line of decreases. So there's a customization you can make without having to really make any, any major changes to the pattern. But the other thing about people's feet is that we're the same here and here, but the vast majority of adults are bigger just can you sort of see where this circumference would sit on your own foot? I refer to that as the front of heel circumference. It's not an elegant way of putting it. But the vast majority of adults, we need more sock fabric to fit around that part of our foot so it stretches nicely and it feels comfortable. And so we've got increases to here. And then we turn the heel using short rows. And then you decrease away those extra gusset stitches while working the heel flap. And it's, I think, I, I didn't invent it, so I'm allowed to say this. I think it's a very elegant architecture. I think it's kind of cool. So it. that's what this sock pattern is all about. So that gusset, we call it a gusset. Mm -hmm. Gusset's a tailoring term, by the way. And it, it gusset is defined as a triangular piece of fabric that's used to size or shape a piece of clothing. And can you see that there's a triangle here? Mm -hmm. It's like a triangular insert that's widened out that foot so it fits comfortably and doesn't pull too tight, you know, around the heel. That's what that's all about. So that's why there are those increases. So that's this toe up sock structure and what's nice about working with double knitting yarn with the dk weight especially if you've not made one of these sock structures before if you've not made a sock before is it just goes that little bit more quickly and as well honestly you can see your stitches a bit better too which is good if you're learning a new skill mm -hmm. um so with this as i mentioned it begins with a is it fair to say a slightly tricksy cast on? I, I definitely, I, we teach this class in person in the yep. morning. And so I was responsible for demonstrating the Judy's magic cast on. And I really like Judy's magic cast on. Um, yeah. I've been using it and the Turkish cast on yep. for, for toe up. And um, there's there's an elegant little pivot that you have to do with your hands to yeah. make it really work. And do you want me to do a demo of how I uh yes, how I do it? Yes. So the way that I talk about Judy's magic cast on is for me, it's an evolution or it's just a variation of the long tail cast on. So I always use the long tail cast on for my top down socks. I actually use the long tail cast on for lots of things because it goes once you get the hang of it, it's quick. So the way that I like to approach and what unlocked Judy's magic cast on for me was thinking about it as a variation of the long tail cast on. So I set myself up to do my long tail cast on and I put my hands in position for my long tail cast on. But then what I do is I go get a second needle. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so that's how I start. So this isn't the the, the hold that ne you necessarily see, but th this worked well for me because I this feels comfortable for how I hold my yarn and needles. So if you do the long tail cast on, you just use the same old method. And then for me, it's I think of it as a game of opposites. Mm -hmm. My right needle has a stitch. So now my left needle needs a stitch. And the way that I approach it is I take the yarn that's on the right, I'm wiggling my index finger here, mm -hmm. drape it over and into the middle. Now my left needle needs a stitch. So I take the yarn that's on the left and I drape it over and into the middle. And again, opposites. Now, I also know there's a bunch of variations of Judy's magic cast on and people will discuss at length which way around you're supposed to wrap the yarn. I like wrapping the yarn on both sides into the middle because then that's kind of one thing I have to learn rather than focusing on remembering which goes which way. They both go the same way, which is over and into the middle. So do you see what I mean about the opposites? Mm -hmm. If my right needle needs a stitch, I take the left yarn. I am sticking my tongue out, by the way, and draping it into the middle. <laughs> and now my left needle needs a stitch and I take the right yarn and drape it over and into the middle. And then I always, before I let go, I always count to make sure I've got the same number on both sides. One, two, three, four, five, six, one. Because the other thing about Judy's magic cast on is the minute that you let go of the yarns, I always feel like I've lost, sort of, I've lost it in that it's hard to figure out which one goes where. Mm -hmm. So that's step one. And what you're doing here is you're getting little pearl bumps on the inside there. Mm -hmm. So the next thing that's a bit tricksy about Judy's magic cast on is the last stitch that you cast on is really not very stable at all. Mm -hmm. What I do is I pivot the needle away, the top needle, because you're holding it so that we're looking not at the pearl bumps, but at the smooth side. Mm -hmm. And the last one I cast on is top right. And if I pivot that needle away, it's not even really a full stitch. It was pretending to be a stitch, but it's not. So what I do to knit that is, and this is very much a kind of just make it work moment. It was Tim Gunn in Project Runway who just say make it work. Mm -hmm. So I just Tim Gunn it, right? I just make it work, which is to say, I'll sort of twist these around each other and knit that first stitch. And if I have to pull that tight, I'm gonna keep twisting and keep pulling it tight. And then I knit the next stitch and it's then when you've knitted the second stitch, it starts to sort itself out a bit. And then you knit the third stitch. And I'm, moving so carefully and I'm not joking about sticking my tongue out here. This is one of these things where I'm holding it really carefully and I'm just focused because they're hard, right? This is one of these moments where you're doubting that this is right. It doesn't feel like it could possibly be right because it's too tight, but 25 minutes, Calvin, you can eat. Frustratingly, you do want it tight. So there's the last stitch. So as soon as I've knitted across the first half, things start to be a little bit better behaved. And this is where I will, where are my stitch markers? This is where removable stitch markers come into play because I grab a green one And the green one is the start of my round. So I'm just going to clip it just at the beginning of the round. So I've knitted halfway across. I've got the second side of the round to worry about now. And this is where I will also divide, divide these stitches up. If you're using double points, I will divide them up. Now, if you've wrapped the way I've done, which is the always into the middle, what you might notice is that these stitches are backwards on the needle. 
Yes. Their left leg forward. But that's okay. The way we handle that is we just knit into the back loop. So there's one, two, three. And then the other side is- Do you ever cast on, or you always want to go onto your double points. So you stay on the double points because this is a little bit simpler if you use magic loop. Um, it is a little bit simpler. Yeah, and I can grab a needle and do a, a magic loop demo too. I mean, with magic loop, the only thing that's different is that you wouldn't be introducing that third needle, right? So right. yeah, that does, it, it well, makes it look a little less porcupine-y. Well, also the- um, the stitches at rest when you're doing that first row are on the cable instead of on a needle. And so yes, so it's slightly bit. less tight. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll be honest. One of the reasons I demo when I do the demos on a double pointed needles is I find just the, the frame is so small magic loop. It's hard to see what sometimes it's hard to see what's going on, but I could certainly, I mean, if you've done the demo, it sounds like I maybe don't need to do that. Well, I, I did that this morning. You're fine. This is perfect. In fact, yeah. I had two people doing double points and I had to start them on magic loop. So this, they will, they will thank you. Oh, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Will. Excellent. Well, so can I talk about a couple of other things I do in my patents here? I want to talk about the, my increase. Yes, please. Um, that was also a little, uh, it was a little surprising to some of our um, knitters today because we are used to doing a make one left or right in the toe. Right. Absolutely. Well, here's the deal with make one right or make one left. I find in that, in that first round, yeah. it's really hard. There's just like it's quite tight. There's not a, not much to pick up in the way of strands. And I never felt confident about which strand I, I would pick up in that cast on edge. So I dodged the issue entirely. The other reason I like my backwards loop make one. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm slightly out of focus. This backwards loop make one. It's easy, it's neutral, it's non-denominational. It doesn't have a particular left or right lean. Mm -hmm. It's also useful, obviously you're just knitting these plain, so not a problem. But if you're increasing into a pattern stitch, like ribbing or, or seed stitch or something, mm -hmm. because this is doesn't establish itself in pattern till the following round, so it makes it easier to figure out what it needs to be. So I use this a lot, this backwards loop make one. I refer to it sometimes as M1Z because it was a reading a book of Elizabeth Zimmerman knitting without tears where she referred to this. So to distinguish it because M1R and M1L L, and then there's various other increases and the terminology gets a little bit fuzzy. Um, but I use this backwards loop make one an awful lot. It's neutral. Mm -hmm. It's easy. It's quick, and if you're at the point where you haven't yet memorized which is which with the right and the left, mm -hmm. or you run into difficulties, because I know some people run into difficulties with make one right and make one left, where they get holes because maybe something didn't go quite right. This just dodges that issue entirely. I think this is wonderful. I teach a lot of people to knit, and some of the people I teach have... Um, less dexterity in their hands. They're not as practiced as, yeah. as somebody who's been knitting a long time. So they're, they're really just starting out. And the M1L and, and M1R are very, um, especially if you're doing it in fingering weight. Yeah, it's really hard. And again, in those first few, like in the first few rounds, when you're working against the cast on edge, it's in fingering weight yarn. It's so tiny and it's so tight. And I mean this lovingly. It's, I mean, nobody's going to get that close to the toes of your socks. Are they really? Probably. No. <laughs> no matter how beautiful they are. These are, once you've shown them to your friends at midnight, nobody's going to see them. So you really, those, all those M1R and M1Ls are beautiful. It, they're not required at this sort of gauge of yarn and fingering weight yarn in particular. And then I discovered that, you know, I sort of, if, felt liberating. I don't even have to use them in thicker yarn either because a DK, DK you can barely tell. 
So I will use those if I, in all sorts of circumstances where I'm doing a top, you know, if I'm doing a top down seamless sweater, I will use those too, because it just, it's a, just that little bit easier. Wait, you're saying you can use a, a backwards yeah. loop cap increase anywhere? Yeah. I use it any, wherever it says M1, I use that, yeah. Am I blowing your mind? Blowing my mind a little. In a good way, I hope. In a, well, in a good way, because I feel like I've knitted for a really long time and M1L and M1R, it feels like they only just start, started showing up in the last 10 years or so. Am I wrong? Have they always- You know what, I think, yeah, they've been more common. I would also say that what we're seeing is because we're seeing more standard language around those. I've okay. seen those increases with different names. Okay. Um, and sometimes what you get when we're thinking about older patterns, sorry, I've got a handful of stitch markers. I don't know if it's going to make a lot of noise here. Um, I think what we see in older patterns as well is the language is looser and less precise because you might just see ink. Mm-hmm without maybe because what you're doing in a pattern where it says for example in, increase at the beginning and end of every row that's how patterns used to appear mm -hmm. you're making an awful lot of assumptions about what knowledge the knitter has and so those are patterns that are con deliberately condensed so that you know remember when they used to have to print books and ship them and magazines and things, right? So these will be terms, that's a much more condensed way of saying, giving the instruction increase at the beginning and end of, or increase at both ends of row, rather than knit one, M1, R, knit to the last, however many stitches, right? That takes up more words. So we would see those terms. So it wasn't that those types of increases weren't being used, but they weren't necessarily being referred to by those names. I'm getting deeply theoretical here. I'm hoping this is interesting. <laughs> know that. This is always the danger with me but know that really that backwards loop make one if make one right or make one left are tricky because of the thickness of your yarn maybe your needles aren't pointy enough um if it's hard especially in a fresh cast on edge also i wouldn't want to use make one right and make one left necessarily when you're doing it with a really small stitch count because you're you're just demanding too much of the yarn Mm -hmm. you're pulling up from the row below or if you can't remember it or if you find that you just run into trouble with it some knitters find that they make holes because maybe they're not picking the thing up right or whatever or they just have to google it every single time just use the backwards loop it's all good yeah i i totally agree the best um skill set is the one you can remember yeah yeah <laughs> nicely put i like that i like that a lot yeah so yeah yeah and so what i do with the toe because every pattern of mine, you know, I've got some sneaky cheeky uh, learning things here. With the toe, I do the make the the backwards loop make one or the M1Z for Zimmerman, but I do do M1R and M1L for the gusset increases. Right. The, I do it there for a couple of reasons. It's a smidge more visible. Okay, three reasons. One, it's a smidge more visible. Number two is that your fabric is well established at that point, and it's just going to be easier to do and frankly easier to see. The other thing is because of where I place the increases, you, you'd end up having to stick a, a backwards loop on the beginning and ends of the needles, and that's can you can get a little bit of looseness that way. Okay. But yeah, but that way also you can learn both. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. Good. The, um, the sock club is doing the cast on today. And then I gave them in the morning class. So I will say this for everybody because we have people who tune in or, or come on to the recording later. Um, we did, I did, I'm going to share my screen for just a second. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do my document camera. Oop. Uh, not very fast today. I'm pinning you. Okay. Remove spelling. There we go. There. I'll pin me. So um, I drew a picture today because you talked about this, but I just want to make it super clear 
for everybody. I drew this lovely picture of my document camera. And it, it is essentially an outline of my foot. And what I said was the way that the pattern is written, and this is this has to do with your um, using negative ease and being very specific about where the where the end of the toe is. So we're casting on for the toe and then we're knitting an indeterminate number of inches or centimeters. And then depending on your size, you need to stop when you're so many inches from the end of the foot. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So this number is what we are all actually knitting. So to do this, you need to know what length your foot is. Exactly. And, and which size you're doing, how many inches from that length to stop. Exactly. So yeah. This is math. Here. Well, it's it's I I'll give you arithmetic. Okay, but I mean it's, it's just that don't I don't want them to I, I, don't be confused. You're not supposed to knit four and a half inches, right? If that's what your pattern says, exactly. Be very, be very clear that this number is not four and a half inches if your foot is not exactly nine inches long. Exactly. But if your foot is nine inches long, it is four and a half inches. Yeah. So here, the way that I, I've got a couple of slides actually. Sure. On okay. this. I will, I will pin you again. Let me see. There you Thank go. you. I don't know why it's not seeing my. So the homework as you're setting up, I just wanted to say that the homework was for the um, the group to get to the end of the gusset increases if possible. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a good, that's a really good place to start. So you'll knit until it's time for the gusset and the heel. And that length is personal to your foot. The pattern knows how long so if I show you this, the pattern knows how long, let me get my annotations. I've calculated these two lengths. The pattern knows how long this is. You, as the person holding the foot, that's a silly thing to say, <laughs> as the person measuring the foot, is you know how long that is. Does that make sense? Yes. Because, so measure your full foot length and then subtract off what I'm telling you is the length of the gusset and the length of the heel. So that's why it says knit until it's such a distance short of your finished foot length. That's a much more elegant slide than mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I think I like, because what I liked was yours was uh, like, it was an outline of a foot. Mm -hmm. um, so, but hopefully between the two, that will make sense. It was interesting in the class today because one of the participants said, but that's nowhere near, you know, where the ankle is going to be. And I said, no, because you have to make the gusset first. Yeah, absolutely. And she said, oh, 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 the gusset. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Well, yeah, because there are socks, there are toe up sock patterns that don't have gussets. And so sometimes what you get, you know, an afterthought heel or a short row heel, sometimes you knit plain for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm all about the gusset here because you can see, I mean, these are my feet. You can see my foot's like most feet are bigger in front of the heel. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's all about. It's about matching the shape of the foot because, and you mentioned those magical words, which were negative ease. So we wear our socks stretching to fit a little bit so that as the yarn relaxes out during the day, they don't fall off. So the, the, the sock should be about three quarters of an inch to an inch smaller around than your foot. When you put it on, it will stretch to fit a bit and then it will stay in place because the fibers that we knit with, we knit socks with those wools, those animal fibers, they have a little bit of gift to them. That's one of the reasons wool's wonderful because as your feet give during the day, right? Our feet expand during the day, especially if we're walking a lot or standing a lot. So the wool relaxes with them, but you don't want them to relax so much that they fall off. Right. So that's what that negative ease is all about. 
have you can you speak at all about having um superwash versus non-superwash wool or nylon in the wool i had um a participant who this morning who um has blocked some socks and felt like they grew so there's can i talk about blocking as well yes excellent good oh sock yarn my favorite topic, right? Okay, so <laughs> I'm a massive fan of super wash wool for socks because no matter how careful I am about sorting my laundry, legs of jeans hold socks, do they not? And leggings. So no matter, you like, it just, I'm not vigilant enough in sorting my laundry. There's two of us in this house and I'm not going to count the socks when I'm doing my laundry to make sure that we have all pairs. So from a pragmatist perspective I'm going to choose a super wash sock yarn most of the time and if I'm giving them as a gift unless I'm giving them as a gift to another fiber person I'm absolutely choosing a super wash just because and that way lies sadness if they accidentally fall in the machine and again they they hide in the legs of of jeans and I wear leggings a lot and when you pull the leg the leggings kind of roll down and take the socks with them so disasters where I am quite particular is I really like a sock yarn that has nylon in it. I am not a fan of 100% wool sock yarns mm -hmm. because they're just not going to last long um, enough. They're just not. And especially, I hope that I not, I'm not a 100% merino should not be used for socks. 100% merino is not for your feet. It's for your head. It's for your shawls. This is 100% merino. But merino is softness in a yarn is equals fragility. It will just wear. So these merino sock yarns, if you see something that's, if it may be sock thickness, but use it for hats, use it for shawls, use it for all of that stuff. So I like a sock yarn that is got, I'd say minimum, sort of 20 to 25% nylon is my magic number. Mm -hmm. And I look for ones that aren't merino based or aren't <laughs> predominantly merino because merino is just too pretty. It's just too fragile. It's just, it will break your heart. Um, so I like sock yarns that just say 80 or 75 percent wool because it's like buying olive oil. If it says just says olive oil, it's probably going to be a mix. If it says extra virgin cold pressed olive oil from the orchards of George Clooney in Tuscany, <laughs> you know, you're going to end up paying more money for it. But it's it's going to be worth it because what do we know about extra virgin cold pressed olive oil? I have a, had a friend who was teaching me about making salad dressings. It's a beautiful color and it's fragrant. Right. And so you use that for salad dressings where you see the color and you get the fragrance of the olive oil, but you don't saute onions and garlic and chili peppers in the expensive stuff use the inexpensive stuff for your onions and your chilies and your garlic and i'm mixing metaphors here but wearing socks is very much you know you, you're just gonna wear them out so super wash wool absolutely i do very much very much like nylon in it if you don't want that if you don't want man-made fiber silk is actually a good substitute silk and mohair in the sock yarns can take the place of nylon as well but i want to talk about blocking yes because there are many, many misunderstandings. This is kind of one of my, I would say it's one of my little bit of, a bit of a pet peeve about how we write knitting patterns where, and it goes back to trying to condense everything to make it short. So you see the word block all the time and it's just this general word. And for reasons I understand, the concept of blocking has become very strongly associated with the concept of stretching. Hmm. And it's not true. The vast majority of your knitting, the way that you block something is you wash it and dry it the way you intend to wash and dry it as you take care of it. The only fabrics and fibers and projects that need to be stretched are lace shawls. And even then only lace shawls made out of wool or silk or other animal fibers. Because stretching actually only works with wool and silk and other animal fibers. So you wouldn't, you couldn't stretch a lace shawl made out of cotton or synthetic because it wouldn't do anything. And mm. with an item that is intended to be worn with negative ease, stretching it and drying is throwing the fit off. 
because if you stretch it when you dry it, you you are taking away its ability to stay up on your leg and stay in place on your foot. The way that we block, and I put block, I always put block in air quotes because it is confusing. Mm -hmm. The way that you block your socks is that you wash them and then you, and I'm looking for a picture here, and then you let them air dry. So sock blockers take excellent photographs. Like we use, we own and we use sock blockers, you know, the foot shape things that stretch the socks out. They're so good for making your socks look good for social media, pictures for social media. But you shouldn't be drying your socks on blockers because you're compromising the fit. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah totally makes sense i think you may have blown some more minds good excellent so stop with the stretching because okay. the other thing about stretching is Calvin, you can eat okay hey, the other thing about stretching is that um if you have to stretch your thing to bring it to 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 the right size you're going to have to do it every time you wash it mm -hmm. And when it comes to like a sock, fine, you could put it on a block, whatever. But when it comes to something like a sweater, that means that every time I wash this thing, I'm going to have to stretch it to pin it, which is, well, the laundry room in this house is in the basement and it's a very old house and the ceilings are low and it's dark and it's full of spiders. So the less time I spend in the laundry room, the better. So no, block, wash and dry in a manner that is appropriate for your fabric and your project. That's it. Because they fabrics and fibers do change when we wash them. We know that. And that's okay. And we plan for it by I'm going to say it. If you're measuring your gauge, although I'll tell you how I measure gauge for socks. If you're measuring your gauge, you're washing your swatch. I'm going to put air quotes around swatch. Do you wash your swatch and you knit to your washed gauge so that you know when you wash it, it's right. Yes. All what right. Say, so let me show you. Where's my other saw? Yeah, I'll make a. I'll, I'll give you a list. Oh, I'm, I'm a little bit too to far with this, this one, but let me show you how I swatch with air quotes. I got some piece of light bread, Calvin. With a butter. sock. I don't know if you can hear that, but there's somebody's voice. Yeah, somebody's. I'm trying to find whoever it is that's not muted. So oh, um, I'm a little bit further on with this actually, but the way that I swatch for socks is I knit a bit. So if it's a fingering weight yarn, if it's one of my usual yarns, the usual sort of thickness of yarn, I will uh, grab my usual needles. I will cast on the appropriate stitch count, assuming that I'm going to get gauge. Mm -hmm. I will work the ribbing and then I will feed a lifeline. You familiar with a lifeline? Yes. I'll feed a lifeline and then I'll work um, an inch or two of stockinette stitch. And then I wash it. And by washing it, I mean, I just will fill up a Tupperware container, a plastic cont uh, container with some lukewarm water and let this like what's great about the DPNs is that this just sits on the sort of the edge of the container and this gets wet. I let it soak for about 20 minutes. I squeeze the water out. I lay it flat to dry. And then the following day, I once it's dry, I will measure it. And if I'm bang on with my needle size, I will do the dang dance of joy and I'm good. <laughs> if I'm off on my needle size, I will pull back only to the lifeline because ribbing, <laughs> right? Pull yeah. back to the lifeline and then change my needles and go again. Perfect. Yeah. So that's, so yeah. And uh, now with well, a and, and sock, you're absolutely swatching as you go. Like the toe is your swatch, but you, again, you have to wash it. Okay. Because it's, it's not done till it's blocked. Yeah. And again, and I actually generally avoid the B word because the problem as a knitting instructor and as a pattern writer, the word 
Block, I always irony quotes, I always put air quotes around it. Block is just, I can see the thought bubble above people's heads, right? It's the stretching and the pinning and the wires and the mats and the sock blockers and all of that nonsense. So I just say wash because I kind of, it dodges the issue. Is that fair? Does that make sense? Oh, that totally makes sense. Yeah. So, so but yeah. we've done um, a swatch in the round, drawing the, the yarn behind. Excellent. And then cutting it. Yes. And, um, but we did it with 40 stitches. And so we had a discussion at one point that if you're casting on a sock that's 64 stitches or 56 stitches or 52 stitches, then it's essentially already a swatch. Well, that's so. it. And that's exactly, yeah, yeah. So this is a swatch I did in the round. It's, it's I didn't bother casting on because this is actually for a hat that I'm working on. So I didn't want to cast on the full hat circumference. Okay. But yeah, heck yeah, a sock circumference. A sock is practically your swatch. So why not lean in? The other thing I, I try very hard to avoid but I is like cutting the these. Line. Oh, you don't cut them? No, I try very, because it's just, that's yarn gone. And when you're knitting, you know, if you're doing something where you're, you, I, you know, the yardage might be a bit short. I'm trying, I'm trying hard to keep the, uh, to keep as much of the yarn as I possibly can. You can't re-knit this for a, a, an accurate gauge read. Like you couldn't undo this and swatch on it with it again but you can absolutely re-knit swatched and washed yarn. That's absolutely fine. So what I'm doing when I'm swatching, like this is a hat for a hat that I'm going to be doing. So I pulled this from the outside of the ball. I will knit the hat from the inside of the ball. And if I need to use this, I will undo it and use it. So yeah. So you just said something that I think was very um, interesting. You said you don't swatch with re-knitted yarn. Correct. You can't get an accurate read. Like if this was the wrong needle size, mm -hmm. you can't undo this, re-knit it and get an accurate read because it's done the ramen noodle thing. Yeah. Okay. So if I needed to, now this is the great thing about being a designer. I only have to swatch once because I just measure it and I'm good. You, it's, you guys have to. <laughs> <laughs> we have to match your gauge. <laughs> right. It's all good. Right. No. So, um, but, you know, if you have to try again with a different needle size, you need to, so I will just cast on from here, right? Like I'll keep them all attached. So I often will change the stitch, maybe do a row of uh, reverse stock in it and then continue yeah. with the next needle size. Yeah. So that we have kind of a record of what I've. Very smart. Yeah. And in fact, especially when I'm knitting flat, what I will do is I'll typically do if I'm matching to a pattern, I'll take three needle sizes. I'll do the one in the pattern, the one smaller and one larger and do a three piece swatch. OK. Yeah. So, that's, yeah. But with socks, they are you are exactly right. I mean, if you're casting on 60 stitches anyway, whatever the number is, that's practically a swatch. Uh, so, you know, save yourself. The ribbing, if you've knit, because ribbing's pesky. I think ribbing's pesky. Ribbing is pesky, but it never occurred to me to swatch it um, with the lifeline in. I think that's a brilliant piece of advice. Thank you. There, that's that's another mind blowing piece. I'm of good. Advice. I'm glad to help. I, th I think that, I mean, when you say mind blowing, I hope in a good way. So, Absolutely. are there uh, other questions I can answer about this? Um, would you like people to unmute to ask? Yeah. Them? Please go ahead. Do you have questions? I know, um, I don't know if Liz is on. Uh, Liz Robinson is um, a customer of ours and contacted you to teach for the Northeast Ohio Knitting Guild, Knitters Guild, a few years ago. And so she's hey, very warmly. Are you on? Yes, I am. Yes. Hello. <laughs> And I think I've been, sorry, Liz. Go ahead. I was going to say, and I think I've mentioned that my friend Olga Olaf um, has met you several times in classes and speaks very fondly of you. Yeah, Harry is asked. Thank asking. you. So, so I do have a question. I have a couple of your books. Oh, yes. Which I really love. And Thank I, you. when I first started knitting socks, I liked your sock patterns because the first one I found, you didn't do the, uh, the close the toe for the top, for the cup down, you didn't do that pesky little- um, Grafting, nope. 
drastic. You you did you went down. You decreased about eight stitches and pulled it through. Yeah. But do you which which do you prefer? Uh, I'm not a fan of that grafting, also known as Kitchener stitch, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's pesky. It's annoying, right? Yeah. Until you're good at it, you have to look it up. I mean, there's all the cheat sheets. The other reason I'm not a big fan of it is I find that it's hard to get a smooth, a nicely shaped toe, right? You get one of my favorite ever emails. The subject line was, my socks have ears. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? And when you graft, you get kind of a funny little ear. So it's hard to get a nicely shaped toe, toe with the grafting. And it's just a bit pesky. So also my toes aren't flat across the top. So I don't always use the flat top toe. So yeah, my pref I prefer it's a slightly adjusted shape. I've written an article for Modern Daily Knitting, if you're a top down sock knitter, uh, all about um all about this all about sock toes and um you know the technique is sometimes referred to as grafting and sometimes referred to as kitchener stitch uh grafting is sort of the historically accurate term kitchener stitch there was a dude called lord herbert kitchener who kind of co-opted the name uh it turns out that lord herbert kitchener was a deeply unpleasant man who did some pretty nasty stuff and i don't think he deserves to have a cool knitting technique named after him so you'll see more and more people i think I'm referring to it with the, the name that's technically accurate and it pre-existed the man. You know, why did some man have to grab, take the na name something you didn't even invent? Boo. Anyway, so grafting. But yeah, you may also know it as Kitchener Stitch, but I like that cinched toe. Yeah. We have a question from Carrie. Who yes, I've just there's... seen that in the chat. Okay. So Carrie says, is there a particular heel that's better for flat arches? So Carrie, a super question, and I have a question for you in return because when someone says to me flat arches i'm never sure exactly what they're saying about the shape of their foot because you can have and i am going to show you a diagram again just the last diagram here um so this is just the diagram i give to show people where to measure if you've got a flat arch does that mean, and you know, these are just the different options. For some people, that just means that this part of the foot is flatter. Uh, for other people, it means that, you know, this it doesn't sit as high. But really, if you're a sock knitter, the right thing to do is to actually measure this circumference to make sure that you're getting a full sense of your foot. Now, if this circumference is really close to your ball of foot circumference, then you have a foot that will be super with a short row heel. But for most knitters, most people, we are a good 10 or 15 or even 20% larger in this circumference than we are here. And a short row heel won't work because a short row heel doesn't have a gusset. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So exactly. what happens with a short row heel is it's either fits well there or at your toe. But so when, so Carrie, does that make sense? Like I would say rather than, cause it's socks fit differently than shoes. And with shoes, we're trained to think about high arches and high insteps and things, but get the measurement and then go from there. And Carrie said, yes, that helps. Thank you. Good. Excellent. Kate, you've been so wonderful and so generous with your time. We are very grateful for having you with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. Um, I hope maybe we can have you back again. And, and maybe if you're traveling, have you come down to Ohio? Because you're not. That would be fun. Yeah, I'm starting to travel again. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm always happy to talk about sock knitting. So it's a joy. <laughs> I get to hang out with people that talk about my favorite thing. It's all good. Um, I've put a link to my website in the chat. On my website, there is a, first of all, there's a way you can email me, although I'll drop my email address in the, I think it's probably on the, um, uh, um, on my website, there's a in the top, there's a articles, tutorials and techniques section. And if you go to resources for knitters, 
there's I've written tons and tons and tons of articles all over the place. And there's a whole bunch of so stuff I've written about sock knitting. I've also written a book about sock knitting. We carry too, your so. book. And we have been referencing it for the class um, for Sock Club uh, since we started. So. Oh, well, I'm very pleased to hear that. Thank you. you. You're, you're our hero. <laughs> oh, hush. Hush. Anybody in it socks, honestly, I feel like, you know, you guys are my heroes too, and that we all love to do the same thing. And you liked, you're happy to listen to me talk about my favorite thing. It's a win. Well, we started Sock Club because I love knitting socks. And like you, I don't think that there should be a prescription that you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way. I've heard many people tell me the rules of sock knitting and I don't believe them. And I don't, and, and I'm, I am also like you where if I'm running out the door, I don't want my double points. I tend to lose my double points. They're not <laughs> helpful to me on a plane trip anywhere. So, um, so it, it's wonderful. And uh, also Kelly said that uh, you, you, that what you were saying definitely tracked for her. So I think you have spoken right to our hearts. Well, thank <laughs> You're just you. the kind of sock club that, that likes what you have to say. Well, so thank, thank you, you so much. much. Excellent. Well, perhaps we will see each other again. I hope so. I very All right. Much. Happy socking. Uh, good luck. I hope it goes well. And I hope you enjoy wear, knitting and wearing them. We uh, will uh, hopefully we'll send you some emails with pictures of them at the end. Love it. Yes, please. Okay. Thanks Thank again. you. All right. Be warm, everybody. It's not spring yet. I don't know about where it's still cold here. Have a great week. And Sock Club will be back on May 1st for the heel turn. Okay. Excellent. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.